Hello, everybody, and thanks for tuning in to Between Two Stands, a show that takes a closer look at the individuals that make up the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. My name is Andres. I'm Scott. I'm Abe. What's going on, fellas? Hey, how's it going? Good to see you're outside going, today. Guys? Yeah, getting some fresh air, man. One of the one of the one of the nice days we have here in Michigan. Yeah, <laughs> they, don't, they don't come too Love, often. Loving hearing the birds. <laughs> yeah. Um. So we actually got a very interesting question. I thought from a guy all the way in Brazil. Which now there's no excuse for anyone who hasn't submitted a question in Detroit because someone's submitting one all the way from Brazil. That takes a lot more work. Uh, takes a lot more work. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the email speed is, just has to go so much further. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, he, he asked, I would like, oh, uh, what, what, his name is Isaac, by the way. Um, I would, Isaac asked, I would like to know if you guys ever thought of having a career outside of music. Which one and why? Abe, you want to start us I'm, off? Uh, sure. I think uh, I've gotten that question a couple times in the past, and I sort of go back to you know the people that uh, influence us, influence us most in life. And actually, um, I grew up. Um, my dad's been traveling a lot for work. He's a business consultant, uh, specializes in, in turnaround management, um, you know, helping companies you know through bankruptcy and stuff like that. And he just loves his job. And you know, when we talk about doing something that you love. I don't know a lot of people besides musicians that I meet that do, and he is one of them. And so I sort of feel like if I were to go back and do it all over again and not have a chance to go into music, I probably would have gone into some sort of business consultant just because he loved what he did and um, or loves what he does since he's still working. Um, and, you know, just go to business school and, and see how it all would turn out. Nice. What about you guys? Very cool. Uh, I, I can go next. Um, it's interesting because like, I didn't have a backup plan when I was going through like music school or anything. I was very much like, I'm going to go in this 100%, and then if I completely fail, I'll figure it out. Uh, and and uh, th thankfully, I, I am where I am. But I have always thought, and I mean, things like this pandemic sort of make you think like, well, I can't, I'm not working right now or I'm not performing doing what we do. So right. what, you know, like who is and what, what other possibilities are there for, for people? And, um, uh, so they're just think they're the dream, the dreams that I've kind of always had ever since I was a little kid, like national geographic photographer, <clears throat> uh, oh, like nice. wildlife photographer. That would be so awesome. I mean, ridiculous pie in the sky but you know uh, yeah. so is being an orchestral musician i hear so. that's tough man but you know those cameramen have to like to get that like uh you remember for planet earth those cameramen had to camp out oh, for yeah. like weeks in a, in a like a, a small tent and like you know like like wait for Just the to perfect get that shot. one perfect shot yeah yeah, yeah i mean but it's you know, it, but you get to travel yeah it's pretty uh, other, incredible though other than that, I mean, I also kind of has, have always liked arguing with people. So I think that like law might be a good, a good just path for me to, to enjoy. Yeah. And, you know, I have some interest there. When well. you argue with people, though, you do it in a way that's like, you're, you're, there's a smile on your face, which I appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I guess for me, um, I guess, you know, it's, it's kind of similar with Scott. Uh, you know, I, I, I chose this career by realizing what I didn't gel with, you know, like the, di just the different subjects in school just didn't really captivate me. Like, like when I was playing music. Um, but, um, uh, so that's how I chose this path. <clears throat> but, um, I guess it would be great. I guess I have two, 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 um, paths. Um, I guess the most furthest and unrealistic one would be um, if, if anyone knows me they love that that i they know that i watch uh, the forensic files and like crime crime um, oh yeah that's shows. amazing yeah and, yes. and, and and i know that it takes a lot of skill and a lot of practice a lot of training schooling whatever to get there but if you could just like 
snap your fingers and I would be like a forensic expert and, you know, solving crimes, I think I would really enjoy that because it's just, it's amazing. It's an amazing process to me. And I know it's, it's, you know, gory and, 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 and very hard to, to look at and, and deal with sometimes. But I just like the puzzle aspect of having clues and having what looks like nothing there and then just pulling information out of that. I think that's really cool. But maybe a more um, realistic uh, career and maybe something I'll do after music would be to just like own like a small a small business of like, you know, like a restaurant or, or like um, something that, that gets people in and, and you know, and, and, and gives joy to people and preferably... A pour over coffee shop. There you go. There, yeah, there's not enough of those. Yeah. Um, and, and since we're, since we're imagining life, maybe, maybe on the beach somewhere, maybe in Central America or, uh, Spain or something. And, uh, you know, maybe like a little coffee shop that, you know, that I own on the beach. What's, what's wrong with that? You're right. That's a much more realistic. I think uh, all of our paths should be on the beach. They should end with on right. the beach. <laughs> so I, guys, I have a, I have a follow up question. Um, not just, you know, if we had to do something else, what would it be? But. At what point did you realize mm-hmm. that your career in music could mm-hmm. work or that your your dreams to be a musician could work? Because I think there's a difference between right the ultimate goal of winning a job or, or having some sort of stability um, and then also, you know, at some point before then you sort of realize, oh, wait, I think this is going to work. So when was that when was that moment for you guys? I remember very specifically, um, we were lucky, lucky enough in my high school, public high school, to have uh, an orchestra, and actually an orchestra that went on tour, Santa Monica High School, and uh, we went on tour to Europe, believe it or not. We raised funds, people, oh, cool. pe- people donated, um, it was incredible. So here I am as a, as a sophomore in, in high school, going on this trip, and I was like, can this actually happen? Like we can do this as a career where we travel to different countries and like play music there. And this is a, this is work for people. I was like, I think I could, I think this is my speed. I, I, I like this. This is, this is exactly, you know, what I love. So that's when I, that's when I really started thinking about it professionally, you know? Um, and, and, um, and, you know, and that's, that's kind of the direction I took from then on. So I have, I guess, a couple different answers. The first time I, I thought about like the possibility that, it, hey, this could be something I could do, I had a youth orchestra director who, who was really encouraging of me. And he, I was in trouble one time, you know, I was like talking, goofing off too much in the back row. Who, you? And, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. No um, way. But uh, uh, Rich and Julio, shout out to him in the Greater Dallas Youth Orchestra system. Um, he pulled me aside and he was just like, you, you're one of the few that can actually do this. So you need to behave a certain way. And that, even though I was in trouble, it was like such an encouraging way to do that. That is it cool. Made me, it, was, it was like That's a good, good thing. And I feel like I had so many times where I was told, you could do this. But you better work, you know, you better work hard, you better keep going. And then uh, I can't say that I was really sure I would be successful as an orchestral musician until I advanced at my first professional audition, which happened to be the first audition I won. The first time I advanced, I went all the way and became the uh, assistant horn of the Louisiana Philharmonic um, in New Orleans. That's a Great good track, good okay. track record. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that was nice. That, uh, <laughs> that, but, but I really ha- wasn't sure that it was possible until it actually happened. Mm-hmm. So I was just chasing it. That's cool. Uh, what about you, Ed? Um, I mean, I think the first, the first time that I saw that I really thought that it could be possible um, was when I was auditioning for colleges. You know, I, I feel like for. Uh, I'm not sure how your guys' experience was in, in you know, youth orchestra in high school, but for us uh, in Chicago, we were sort of in this little bubble where, you know, there was just a really great group of cellists, and um, I didn't really know exactly 
you know, what, where I lined up with anywhere, anyone else, um, anywhere else really. Um, and so then I auditioned to schools and, you know, got in everywhere and I was like, Oh, maybe, maybe this is something I should do. Right. Um, and then, you know, of course, I think each of us has a lot of little things along the way that sort of help yeah. point us in the right direction and, and sort of like really hone in our focus. Uh, for me, I think, um, you know, I really love chamber music. Um, and so for a long time, I sort of thought, you know, I want to be a chamber musician in, you know, a string quartet. And then, you know, you talk to a lot of people and especially people who are in orchestras and they talk about the stability, you know, uh, and the fact that you're not traveling all the time and you get to be with your families more often, that kind of thing as you get older. Um, so that was something that I really considered. And then as I started auditioning, like, you know, like Scott, I, I didn't win my first audition, but I didn't advance until oh, the no, one no. that I actually won. I didn't win so, my first audition. The oh, first audition I advanced in, I won. There were many. Oh, gotcha, 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 gotcha. <laughs> so that just so didn't that's, go that's, anywhere. It was my same thing, too. I, the first audition I advanced in, I won. So that's, you know, that's the, I think that's the, sort of the, the dream as an orchestral musician is to, you know, obviously win a job, but to sort of see that the work is paying off. Yeah, and that it's possible is um, is wonderful. Yeah, I liken it to sometimes when in, 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 when you're in, in your education, you're kind of flying through fog. Sometimes you don't know if you're going in the right direction. You know, up, down, left, right. It's you know sometimes like you know you spend so much time alone in a practice room. It's hard to know if you're like it's like am, am I improving? I, I I don't know. I, you know it's 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 hard to tell because it's such a slow process. But yeah, like you said, there's certain things along the way where you're like, okay, that's you know I'm going the right way. You know, and and that's really right. encouraging. I well, and then as you uh, practice, right, the stand as your standards get higher, it feels like you're getting worse and worse sometimes. Exactly. Oh, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. 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 But also, I think that that alone time in a practice room, especially in like music school for a percussionist, it might be a lot different than like a, a horn player. We play duets and quartets all the time, mm-hmm. and I think mm-hmm. that in percussion, there's just less ensemble work overall. Yeah. yeah, it can be, which is why I feel like you know people. Your studios get, are very close, and tend to be close in the percussion section, just because there's so, there's so much alone time um, that you kind of have to you seek you know uh, human contact, kind of like our <laughs> right. situation right now. Um, yeah, <laughs> but um, well, hey guys, uh, always fun to talk to you. We should get on with our normal show, but um, yeah, nice to talk to you guys. We're gonna introduce well, a hey. new a new segment. You want to tell us about it, Abe? Sure. Uh, so we're going to go to our normal uh, interview with uh, Johanna. And um, before we go, we have a new segment for you guys. It's called uh, Larry's Joke of the Week. And I will see you guys next week. Later, Abe. So I, I just heard that the inventor of the throat lozenge died. Apparently, there'll be no coffin at the funeral. And today, we have the pleasure of interviewing Joanna Yarbrough. Joanna joined the DSO in 2012. She was born and raised in Tallahassee, Florida. She completed her undergraduate at University of Alabama, Roll Tide, and her master's at the Coburn School. She has won many prestigious awards for horn and has played with incredible orchestras around the country. And she has also appeared as a soloist with the DSO. Joanna, welcome. Hello. <laughs> Is this thing on? <laughs> yes, it is. How you doing, Joanna? I definitely like the way voices sound right into the microphone. <laughs> that's that not that's best. not creepy at all. Um, yeah. What's going on? How, how are you? It's been it's been a long time. It has been a really long time, right? Like eight weeks or something now. Yeah. Um, I know, but it's been it's been okay. Cool. You're, okay. you're not you're not bothered by this whole, uh, uh, you know, isolation. I mean, I yeah. I mean, of course, I'm like bothered, but I would say that I'm a bit of an introvert at heart. So there's a little part of me that's like satisfied to finally have a little bit of peace and quiet. Yes, um, and nothing. To do I, with I would, 
I would disagree Time. with that statement entirely, <laughs> but we know each other so well because we sit next to each other. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> there's I, something about me you don't know, Scott. Yeah, we're going to find out today. Out right now. <laughs> so, so, Joanna, we uh, like to start this off by asking you what music is on your stand right now. That's a great question. Um, if any. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. Here's like a very weird thing about me, I guess. Um, I am actually just loving playing fundamentals every day. So maybe some music is not really on my stand at the moment. But like, I love playing scales and long tones. That makes me feel so grounded because I do that every day normally when we are working. So to do it every day now, it just kind of like for 30 minutes or an hour a day, <laughs> um, I can trick myself into thinking like, this is real. I'm still doing this. So. I totally relate to that. The, the I mean, on horn, I feel like those fundamentals, it's a nice way to not have to be so involved in what you're doing on the horn and it's it's a routine it's sort of just like uh oh this helps me feel normal it's probably right. pretty meditative too right i mean oh just... totally and it's like you c c could not that i would but you could turn on the tv while you do it too so it doesn't actually feel like work <laughs> I, i'm very guilty of that <laughs> I mean, it's like exercising in front of the TV, right? You're 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 Don't like do doing it. something, and you're you're yeah, you're going through the motions, and you know that's that's good. It's good. Better than not um, doing it. It's better than not um, doing it. Andreas, is there a percussion like equivalent? Like, would you ever do like drills? Oh or yeah, any, yeah. Or, play, like, play the drum pad um, and just move your hands and like you know keep the muscles going and, and you know, you don't need a full brain for that. I might be crucified saying this, but anyway, um, <laughs> I don't have one anyway, uh, so I think we're good. A lot of, <laughs> good. A lot of other um, instruments kind of require you to, especially mallet instruments require you to be looking at the instrument. And so obviously you can't watch TV doing that, but drum pad, you could kind of play. And, and, and I think if you're, as long as you're moving your hands, you're getting work done. Which is good. That's what we want. Um, so, Joanna, um, since we're getting to the summer, uh, you know, we just want to know what you would be doing if it wasn't for this whole. I don't know if you noticed, but there's a pandemic going on. So, if it wasn't for that, what? yeah, if it wasn't um, if it wasn't for that, what would you have? <laughs> what would you be doing? What would your typical summer look like? Yeah. Um I had a couple of fun projects that I'm a little bit bummed to not be involved in this summer. Um, I usually play with the Brit Festival Orchestra in Oregon. It's in Southern Oregon. Um, it's with our former assistant conductor, Teddy Abrams. Shout out to Teddy. What's up? Um, and it's like a super fun festival, you know, with like lots of friends who've been going for years. I think this is going to be like my sixth year going maybe. Uh, but, you know, it's it's so much fun because you stay with the same family um, every year. And it's kind of like a balance between how much wine can I drink and how can I still <laughs> play the horn well? Um, so it's like, you know, that it's for three weeks. Definitely and, an art to that. Yeah, it's a skill that um, my section has uh, taught me well. And, <laughs> and then, <laughs> well, okay. So sometimes we do like quartets or, or duets or, or, or anything where we'll get together and just play. And often the game is like, is this, is horn playing like bowling where two drinks in you're better and then three drinks in you're way worse <laughs> or is, or is this, uh, you know, and, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's a fun thing to do like for, for fun with each other. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I was the the Brit Horn section. We're like a really tight knit crew. Um, we had commissioned Teddy to write us a piece uh, for Horn Quartet, and we were going to take that up to the International Horn Symposium, which is in Eugene, Oregon. And we were going to represent Brit there um, and play a little quartet recital, including that piece that Teddy was going to write for us. So. Mm. We're a little bummed that's not happening, um, but you know, maybe is it, is it going to happen next year? Next year, maybe, or any plans? I think the next horn symposium is going to be abroad. 
Okay. But I've heard rumors that the one after that might be somewhere with a crimson and white color theme, you know, like a Alabama roll tight situation. It's just a rumor I've heard. Oh, cool. So, you know, cool. might be representing there. You know? Awesome. I wonder if I wonder if this summer is going to throw a little bit of a monkey wrench into the different plans. I mean, yeah. it, I hope that would be that would be great, but uh, it'll be just interesting to see what they do. Yeah. So, Joanna, one of my favorite things about you is that you love classical music, but you also like to hear and listen to other music outside of what we play. Um, can you just tell us some of the music that you enjoy listening to and, and what you kind of get a break from? Like when you take a break from classical music, where do you, where do you go? Yeah, like I find that, I don't know, like I use music the same way everybody uses music to like set a mood or like create a vibe. And for me, classical music is just so associated with my job and the pressure of performing that it does not create like a chill vibe for me like it does for a lot of people. So I tend to avoid classical music when I'm trying to relax. Um, <laughs> but I think that like the love of like really amazing musicians is definitely something that I learned on the job and for being a musician myself. So like my favorite band like ever is the punch brothers and chris mm. Teeley is like in my opinion the greatest musician alive yeah and i will look at the grave saying that he is um, amazing you're right yeah he's so incredible so i love like folk music like the punch brothers but i also love like toro y moi and um tops and men i trust which is a little bit more like dream pop i guess it's like totally the opposite of anxiety inducing it's super chill and laid back and yeah um, i mean yeah, I, I can i can relate to that because you know uh you know people think that because we play classical music that's all we listen to and i feel like it can't be farther from the truth in a lot of ways i, I can't listen to I can't listen to music really at all to go to sleep or to relax or, or especially not classical music because then I start listening to, to it too intently. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I find myself listening to a bunch of different genres to, to relax and unwind. How, That's how, do, funny. Do you do that, Scott? Oh, absolutely. Whenever <laughs> I listen to classical music, if anything, it, it'll get, wake me up. Yeah, you're just kind of like... I'm, it's like, oh, I'm listening really intently or I'm getting excited about the rest of the piece that I know is coming. And it's like, oh, this is great. And right. uh, I mean, it, it's it's amazing because other than the Punch Brothers, everything Joanna just mentioned is foreign to me. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I should I mean, I'll check it out because I trust Joanna's uh, taste. It's it's really, really good. But um, <laughs> but I. I just uh, I grew up with musicians as parents and they classical was on a lot. And so that's what I'm most familiar with. And I'm kind of like gradually reaching out in different ways. Yeah, but, and that's, sorry, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned, since you mentioned Chris Thiele and the Punch Brothers, I'm wondering if like, do you think that your training, uh, your formal training as a classical musician, like influenced your taste in, in non-classical uh, music? Because Chris Thiele, like he's done Bach and uh, Debussy on his on his albums, and I just yeah. want to know what you thought. Well, I think like kind of what I was getting at um, was that like classical music influenced me to only accept really high quality music mm -hmm. and um, and musicians who are really really good at what they do. So like it's really difficult for me to listen to Taylor Swift and not want to bang my head against the wall. Um, Taylor, like Taylor, I hope you're not listening, hope you're not listening <laughs> yeah. to this, Taylor. Ta Taylor Swift, give us a donation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then I'll take it back. Yeah. Um, but, like, um, Aoife O'Donovan, for example, is another musician that I really love. And she does, like, pretty exclusively kind of, like, folk influence music anyways. And yet, like, she went to NEC and got a degree in vocal performance. So, yeah, she doesn't do classical music, but um, she's trained and she knows what she's doing and you can totally hear it in her music. Yeah. 
Um, I can understand that. So another thing that maybe people might not know about you just from looking at you on stage is that you are a cat lover. Yeah. An extreme I mean, cat I lover. I I'm an animal lover, but I can have cats in my house. And uh, I think if you I have, have a, I think if you have a catio, you are a cat lover. I think, okay. I think, I think that, 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 can you explain what a catio is? Yeah, I should, um, maybe I'll send, uh, someone a picture of this to yeah. put it right oh. here. Yeah. Um, it's basically like I was letting one of my cats out, but she was destroying the wildlife, um, in my neighborhood and bringing it like literally to my front door. And so they're gifts. I was like, they're gifts out of love. Yeah. I know. <laughs> don't you want a don't you want a completely destroyed bird that's that's like yeah. uh, hanging on to but life? She could just like <laughs> put a gift receipt with it. Uh, yeah. that'd be nice. um, I would like to return this. Yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> but basically I just like I wanted a place for them to hang out outside, but that was safe for them and safe for all the wildlife um, in my yard. And so Ralph and Scott and Jack, I think Monica was involved too. Like, and my little nine-year-old neighbor was involved. <laughs> like, I had the DSO build me a catio. <laughs> it, it's it was, pretty amazing looking. Like, you know, it's 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 a work of like, art. I mean, if anybody watching this would like to come and reinforce it and like bling it out, because my cats are like they have this huge catio, but. Like, the only place for them to sit is on the ground. So, um, <laughs> if anybody wants to come, like, fix this up, what's up? DM me. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and don't blame me for the shoddy craftsmanship. Yeah, it was me, it, but don't blame me. <laughs> if you push it hard, it will fall over. <laughs> yeah. It's really good looking, but it, it doesn't it, – it's hanging by a thread. It's hanging by a thread. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> um, so – what are some places in Detroit that you look forward to opening up once everything opens up? Like, what are some like restaurants or museums, or, or what are some things that you like to do around town? Other than, of course, the DSO. The DSO, number yeah. one. I mean, come on. Of course, obviously. <laughs> in um, fact, that's one, two, and three. What's number four? Fable <laughs> uh, Gray. Can we? I just like. Are they taking reservations yet? I don't care if it's for November. Like, <laughs> I want to go to Maple Gray. Um, oh, I still haven't been there. I need to, I need to go. All right. Oh, you're in on the right It's dinner. so good. It's yeah. so I just, good. I miss going to dinner with all of you guys. Like, I was thinking about that dinner we did recently where we went to Mink. Yeah, that was fun. That was really fun. That, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I've never eaten so many oysters in my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. So tasty. So good. So yeah, Mink. Um, that was a fun we, night. We went yeah. to La Lady of the House the afterwards. That was really fun. <laughs> now, this is funny though, because until like, what, a year ago, you were like, I do not like oysters. Yuck. I don't want that. And then you had one at Maple Gray and you're like, oh, maybe I like these. All right. Look, <laughs> here's the thing. I grew up on the Gulf Coast of Florida, where the oysters are so big, it's just like a giant snot yeah, rocket. I, I don't like, I don't like that either. Throat. I don't like those either. It's it, it's 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 just not good in terms of the sensory uh, overload. Yeah, like you don't want to have to chew an oyster uh, for like five minutes that's to true. get it down. That's true. <laughs> I, I like oysters. Just give them to me. I, 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 uh, when we went on tour in Japan, I ate one that was, you know, about that big, and it, that might have been a little too. I much, saw but. that. That was the size of my <laughs> fist, man. I I, I, I was like, I took a picture of that. It was, it was incredible. It yeah, did maybe look good. if we can find the picture, we can put it here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, yeah, that was that. Those those are great. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, I think this would be a good time to address a question because I think it'd be interesting coming from two horn players who require their mouth to play. But we had a, a, a question from Karen uh, who emailed us and asked, how is it possible that in all my time watching orchestras, I have never once seen any of you sneeze or cough? Oh, that is like, I mean, I would die before I coughed in a quiet spot yeah. I mean some it totally happens and like it I mean 
I love the audience. Like, you guys are amazing. But when y'all cough in the softest, most delicate <laughs> part, like, we do kind of, like, it, it makes us laugh. And it, like, breaks the mood a little yeah. bit for us. So, like, <clears throat> I try to never. And so, yeah, sometimes, like, you're full on, like, needing CPR by the end of the concert. Yeah. But it's worth it to, like, make that moment last. You know, before uh, this pandemic and everything, it, there was very much a culture of like, if you have a little cold or something, you like you don't you don't want to put the burden on your colleagues to cover for you if you're not that sick, um, because you you've done the rehearsal, you've put the time in, and it it would be kind of uh, stressful on your colleagues to have to cover for you last minute. I think that's probably going to change after this. I think we're all going to be a little bit more careful about making sure we don't infect each other with whatever little bugs we have. But um, that being said, when you have a little bit of a cold and it, you'll have that tickle in your throat and it's excruciating, it oh, is man. so hard to hold a cough back. But another weird thing that does happen, uh, a little bit of a burp while you're playing. Ah. Every now and then in the horn, it's just... It's like, <laughs> oh. it's it, it it comes up and you're playing and you can't stop. I mean, it, you don't you don't want to. And it's like, uh, I think Carl has the best expression for that. He's like, oh great, a little bit more air, <laughs> <laughs> a little boost. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think also. By the way, uh, Karen mentioned that she's like, I notice everyone in the audience is coughing, but you guys don't cough. I think we also have. Uh, an advantage that we know when loud parts are coming. So if we need to cough, we're like, okay, ooh, I'm feeling it, but you know, I just know in, in 15 measures, there's a big fortissimo note and I can just let it out right there. And then, and then, you know, but yeah, you, you, you know, we try to hold it in for those quiet parts because it, it could definitely ruin the moment, especially if it comes from us. Yeah, I would say what's harder than holding in a cough for me is holding back laughter. Yeah. My section and, well, Andres, you too, <laughs> everyone around me is like the funniest person I know. I'm literally surrounded by ticking time bombs of laughter. Yeah. And I've okay. noticed you guys. Okay. I, I, have the, okay. I, I love watching you guys laugh because I have, a, I have a, like a straight shot of you guys. And I will note, I, I, that gives me so much joy watching you guys chuckle and, and uh, you know, I think it's great. Yeah, as if you are not an active participant in trying to make all of us laugh at the same time. Never, never. <laughs> Professionals will. I am like totally amateur. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's great though. I think I think it's great. You know, like um, I, I I love being a part of that. I love you know when we're having fun. I, I think I think people enjoy watching us have fun. I mean, you know, I, I think it's 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 great when we can do that. You know, it's it's not fun when everyone's just super serious all the time. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do love, uh, particularly watching the horn section, uh, crack up. <laughs> I will say we're pretty careful about making sure that, uh, we pick our moments wisely and we never let it get in the way. Uh, yeah. You guys oh, no, make me laugh believe me. all the time. <laughs> it's like the hardest part of my job is not laughing at you. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm so glad I can make your life more difficult. That makes me so happy. <laughs> it's the worst, right? When the hardest part of your job is not laughing. Yeah, that's a great yeah. thing. That's a great thing. Um, I will say, it, we're lucky to have the section we have. We get along yeah. really, really well. Yeah. Hey, Joanna, uh, it's looking like this might be all the time we have, but thank you so much for joining us, and it's so great to see you. Um, Scott, do you want to, uh, do you want to uh, ask the very last question? Oh, yes. So this is the question. Joanna, how does Rite of Spring go? Da, 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 da. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Nice job. Okay. <laughs> I recognize that part. Um, that was nice job. Recap. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Joanna. And um, yeah, I hope I hope we see each other sooner rather than later. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. It's thank great to you see guys. you. You too. <laughs> Take care. Thank you all so much for joining us. On the next episode of Between Two Stands, we'll be interviewing English horn Monica Fosna. 
If you have any questions for us or for our guests, please email them to between two stands at gmail.com and we'll try to answer them. Our spanking new Between Two Stands t-shirts are still on sale at dso.org slash shop. These shirts will only be around until next Sunday, May 31st, so get your shirts now. Also, don't forget to tune into the upcoming watch parties on Facebook Live. On Thursday, May 28th at 7 p.m., we're performing Ravel's La Valse and Richard Strauss's De Rosen Cavalier Suite and Burlesque with Fabian Gabel, Nikolai Zenaider, and Leonard Slacken conducting. On Friday, May 29th at 2 p.m., we will continue to host our weekly educational concert series. And on Sunday, May 31st at 3 p.m., we're playing Wagner's The Ring Without Words, arranged by Lauren Mazel and conducted by James Gaffigan. You can always check out dso.org slash watch parties for more information. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.